Chapter 27 covers chest and abdominal trauma. So with chest trauma, a couple different types of ways that a patient can sustain chest injuries from blunt trauma, which can end up fracturing ribs, sternum, and the cartilages of the, uh, those lower ribs. Compression injuries, just severe blunt trauma causing the chest to rapidly compress. Just kind of way more extensive than getting the wind knocked out of you. From penetrating objects such as being shot, being stabbed, uh, or just overall impalement of some other type of debris or shrapnel. Uh, that can end up damaging internal organs such as the lungs, kidneys, liver, anything really those ribs and upper torso protect. Of course with uh, chest injuries, big thing we're about is affecting the airway. Some types of closed chest injuries, one is a flail chest which is a fracture of two or more ribs in two or more places. So basically you've got a hunk of ribs that are just broke, not doing their job. That will result in uh, paradoxal motion, meaning that the chest doesn't have equal rise and fall. So as you breathe in, those ribs are going to suck in. As you exhale, they're going to go out. Because the purpose of those ribs is when you inhale, the ribs will expand, opening up, that thoracic cavity but with that flail segment it's not going to allow your chest cavity to open up as it should so that will result in severe pain the patient assessment uh, knowing the mechanism of injury of what could have caused the injury and what you're going to be dealing with was it blunt force trauma was it compression injury what so the big thing I'll be looking for difficulty in breathing and hypoxia just from not able to the inability to get air in definitely be some pain at that injury site when you're feeling impressing on the chest cavity you'll feel uh, crepitus maybe movement of the ribs and definitely pain with palpation more like you're gonna see signs of shock due to the ventilatory status failure uh, chest wall contractions seeing that moving in uh, and next you'll see a video of what a flail chest looks like with paradoxal movement For patient care of the flail chest and paradoxal movement, always treat and assess for life threats. That includes A, B's, and C's. Mostly with this, it's going to be the A's and the B's. Give plenty of oxygen, 15 liters not a breather. If they're not breathing adequately with that flail chest, which chances are they won't be, assist those ventilations. Provide positive pressure ventilation. Uh, some protocols in different areas will allow you to use non-invasive positive pressure such as CPAP, which in West Virginia you can use CPAP for a flail chest. Always monitor that patient carefully, always continually checking lung sounds to make sure that it actually didn't damage the lung itself, which in the majority of cases when those ribs break that are going to poke the lungs too and generally about 90% rate with a flail chest there will also be pulmonary contusions and possibly a pneumothorax popping that lung. Just always keep an eye on the respiratory rate and depth, listening to lung sounds continually and aggressively monitor that patient. Open chest injuries, with that it's sometimes difficult to tell what exactly has happened or what's been damaged just from the entrance wound. Assume that all open chest injuries and all injuries to the chest area are life-threatening. With the open chest injuries, it's allowing air to come into the chest. Um, it creates that imbalance in your chest because air is only supposed to come in through your mouth. You're supposed to have one entrance and one exit for air. So as you breathe in your mouth, that's where the air is supposed to come out. So as you breathe in, that chest wall is opening up and that inner thoracic pressure changes. So the pressure inside is lower than the outside. So when you breathe in, it pulls air in through your mouth and in through that open chest injury. But the difference being as you exhale, you'll breathe the air out through your mouth, but that air in that open chest injury becomes trapped and it can't get out. So it'll allow air to come in to places into the chest that it shouldn't be causing stuff to shift or potentially causing lungs to collapse, heart failure, ultimately death. So with the assessment of a sucking chest wound, 
you got to get that wound covered up. Uh, it may or may not be a sucking wound, but any place that there is a possibility of air getting into that thoracic cavity, you need to cover it up. So next you'll see a video of what a sucking chest wound looks like. With care of the open chest wounds, maintain an open airway. Remember, head tilt chin lift or modified jaw thrust to get that airway opened and seal that wound using an occlusive dressing or whatever you can to get that wound covered up. Give them high flow oxygen if need be, help ventilate the patient, but be very cautious. Uh, care for shock, get them warm, get them wrapped up, get them loaded, get them transported, and request ALS backup immediately. Use an occlusive and flutter valve dressings, basically this you can take a occlusive dressing and you tape it on three sides. That leaves a corner of the dressing unsealed. So as the patient inhales, it prevents the air from coming in sealing the wound. But as they exhale, it will allow that air to come out if it does have the capabilities of coming out. So you see here, taping on three sides, leaving this little area open. So as you inhale, that it's not going to suck any more air into the thoracic cavity. And as you exhale, it can allow air to escape if need be. So think about this. Does the patient's chest injury need to be treated during the primary assessment? Do you see an open chest wound, but are they having any kind of airway issues? If they're having airway issues, you need to fix that immediately. Or does um, do you need to cover up with an occlusive dressing? Does this require me to transport to a trauma center? Or is it affecting anything? Or is it penetrated all the way through, thinking about everything in its entirety? So some injuries within the chest cavity. You could have a pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax. Hemothorax, hemopneumothorax. Think about medical terminology, hemo, blood. So blood in the thoracic cavity or blood and air in the thoracic cavity. You could have traumatic asphyxia, just completely being asphyxiated by pressure, whatever may be, that patient's trapped inside a vehicle, can't breathe, a cardiac tamponade, or aortic injury and dissection. So pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax. A pneumothorax, pneuma meaning air, is when air enters that chest cavity in places it's not supposed to be. Air is supposed to be inside the lungs, not any place else around it. The tension pneumothorax is basically where the air comes in and then it starts to, uh, it doesn't have the ability to escape and it's causing tension, causing pressure on the lungs, shifting everything around. So it can ultimately push the lung to the side, as you see in the picture here, pushing that lung to the side not allowing that lung to completely inflate. So with the pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax, they're going to have diminished or absent lung sounds on the affected side. So if you have a patient who's been stabbed or shot someplace in the chest and you don't hear lung sounds to the injured side as well as you do the uninjured side, they have a pneumothorax. If you're not hearing any lung sounds at all, very good chance that they're going to end up developing a tension pneumothorax. So if it's to the point where you're starting to see JVD and that tracheal deviation at that sternal notch, that's a late sign of a tension pneumothorax, a late sign. If it's developed to that point already, already way behind the eight ball and getting that patient treated, the only thing that's going to be able to fix this uh, a paramedic can do a chest decompression or they're going to go to the hospital and get a chest tube. Hemothorax and hemoneumothorax. Uh, the hemothorax is that chest cavity has filled up with blood which can displace and cause pressure on the lung. And a hemoneumothorax is there's blood and air in the chest. So as you see in the pictures here, that pneumothorax, that lung has popped. So there may not actually even be 
any obvious outward signs of an open chest injury. This could just be from blunt trauma causing that lung to pop. So as you breathe air in, the lung, the air is escaping out of that lung, staying in the thoracic cavity, not where it's supposed to be. Blood can come in from those wounds or have a mixture of the blood and the air. So that blood, air, everything can cause pressure, causing that lung to squeeze down, not giving its ability to inflate, and if it develops into a tension pneumothorax, means that that pressure is not allowing that lung to inflate at all and can eventually cause pressure on the heart and the other lung as well, starting to make all that stuff shift around. So if you're starting to see this pressure pushing in, you'll start to see uh, tracheal deviation as the trach and esophagus will start to swing over to the side. Traumatic asphyxia is just a compression of the chest, pushing blood out of the organs, rupturing blood vessels. The chest doesn't have its ability to inflate to allow air to come in. Um, you'll notice the upper torso above where the traumatic asphyxia occurred, the neck and face are going to be darker than the rest of the body. Could have bulging eyes, JVD, ruptured vessels in the face. Just how it would look if somebody was straining really hard, all that blood rushing upward to the face. A cardiac tamponade is a direct injury right to the heart, causing that blood in the pericardial sac, which is the sac that surrounds the heart, providing its kind of lubrication. Uh, all the blood and everything that's in there will become inflamed, vessels in there will bleed out, causing that fluid in that sac to expand. So the blood will back up into the veins, causing JVD, um, and also a shock and narrowed pulse pressure, meaning your top and bottom number of your blood pressure are gonna be getting closer together. So first blood pressure may take maybe perfect, 120 over 80, and then the next blood pressure take may be 110 over 90. That top, top number gets smaller, bottom number gets bigger. So as you see in the picture, a healthy heart over here, the pericardial sac around has a little bit of fluid in it normally. So that sac doesn't really have much ability to expand. So if more fluid and blood gets into that sac, it will press in on the heart. So those ventricles won't have the ability to squeeze and contract. It's basically the same thing as having a major cramp. Those muscles don't have the ability to work because of the pressure and swelling that's um, being forced onto them. So with an aortic injury and, and or dissection, the aorta being that largest blood vessel in the body, um, major penetrating or blunt trauma can end up causing direct or indirect damage, tearing or damaging the aorta. So you can imagine that the largest vessel in the body that has been torn has a leak that could expel a whole bunch of blood. And with that being an artery, that can cause, um, that will be high pressure bleeding, most generally being fatal, unless it's a very small injury, a little small pinhole, but it's still gonna have near exaggerating extent, meaning it's gonna be life-threatening internal bleeding. Patient's gonna have pain in the chest, abdomen, or back that uh, injury depending where the um, aorta injury was at exactly and they will definitely have signs of shock increased heart rate low blood pressure pale cool diaphoresis um, you have a difference in pulse or blood pressure between the uh, right or left side of the extremities because as that aorta comes out of the heart it divides to the left and the right side of the body so if it's damaged to the aorta went to the right side, there's not much pressure getting to the right side of the body as the left. So in the left side of the body where the aorta is still intact, good pulses. The right side where there's an injury, you're going to have weak or no pulses. So you may also, um, there are pulses you could notice a difference in blood pressure or pulse quality between the right and left arms or right and left pedal pulses. Commodio cordis is a very uncommon condition. 
basically uh, trauma to the chest when the heart's just at that right exact millisecond. Um, so what happens is the heart gets thumped really hard at the exact millisecond, sends it into V-fib, causing the patient to go into spontaneous cardiac arrest. Prime examples of this, and this happens maybe once or twice a year, that little league baseball player, you know, 10 year old kid takes a line drive right to the chest, they get hit at that exact millisecond and they go into cardiac arrest immediately. So they're treated just the same as a regular patient who just went into cardiac arrest. High quality CPR and defibrillation will save these patients. So now we'll talk about some abdominal injuries. As with every other injury, they can be an open or closed. Uh, then internal bleeding, if it's uh, affecting those large solid organs, can cause massive internal bleeding, uh, which can be exsanguating, causing pretty quick life-threatening stuff. Those hollow organs, a little bit slower bleeding. So in those abdominal muscles, causing vessels or organs to become lacerated or ruptured. Uh, they'll have serious painful reactions, especially to... Um, those solid organs and the hollow organs can rupture. Uh, so just imagine the uh, intestines rupturing, fecal matter getting around on the internal organs causing widespread infection. Some really nasty stuff can happen in the abdomen. Uh, evisceration can also occur. Basically, the organs protrude out through the wound opening. As you see here in this picture, the evisceration of the intestines, you have a loop of bowel sticking out through an open abdominal wound. Uh, initially, they're going to have pain and pain should be mild, but rapidly become intolerable. They can have cramps, nausea, weakness, be very thirsty, um, and then your main nose is obvious open wounds and lacerations or eviscerations. They can have them anywhere in the abdominal area. Um, could be indications of blunt trauma, uh, some bruising, and more than likely they could have um, end up developing into shock. Uh, they could also be coughing up blood or it could just be isolated abdominal bleeding. They could have a rigid or tender abdomen. So if you get a rigid tender, it could be meaning that abdominal cavity is filling up with blood, especially the rigid part. It takes a little while for that to happen, but it can definitely happen. Uh, with that distended abdomen, um, and they won't be wanting to move because you use abdominal muscles every time you move. So if it's a very extensive injury, they're not going to want to move because it's just going to be way too painful to do anything. So patient care, stay alert for vomiting of that blood. Get suction out, get it ready, maintaining that open airway. Put the patient on their back if it's comfortable for them and keep those legs flexed because that reduces that strain and tension on the abdominal muscles. Give high flow O2 and treat for shock. Cover them up, keep them warm. Uh, don't give the patient anything by mouth. Aggressively monitor vital signs. See if you can see a trend developing of the patient going into shock. Cover up those abdominal injuries. Um, whether you have some kind of large occlusive dressing or anything, they need to be covered up because it could potentially be drawing air into the cavity, uh, thoracic cavity. So anytime there's a chance of drawing air into uh, the body that could affect your respirations, cover it up. So if there's eviscerations, don't poke anything back into the place where you think it should be. Just cover it up with a moistened sterile dressing. Just keep it covered, preventing any kind of infection and just control all the bleeding the best you can. For majorly open stuff, pack it in there to control that bleeding.